Hello, welcome to The Biblical Perspective, an in-depth expositional study in the Word of God. And thanks for tuning into the Biblical Perspective Bible Study. We pray and we believe that our discussion in the Word of God will be a blessing to you. Mm -hmm. I'm Pastor James, and joining me in this presentation for a, a present lesson is my wife, Minister Vera. Great to have you, Minister. It's great to be with you. The topic for this discussion tonight is giving up to gain. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get to the prelude. The biblical passage for our discussion is the autobiography of the Apostle Paul and is the greatest testimony recorded in the New Testament. He met Christ during his Damascus Road experience that is recorded in Acts 9, 1 through 9. As he was on his way to persecute Christians. When he left Jerusalem for Damascus with a legal authority given to him by the Sanhedrin Council, thus was they're also known as the ruling body of Israel, he was Saul of Tarsus, a proud and self-righteous Pharisee. Mm -hmm. After his encounter with the risen Christ, he became Paul. The apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. Luke's rec record the, in the book of Acts did not give detail of this transformation in his thinking, but Paul provides them in the text, of, text for our lesson for tonight. In the passage, Paul speaks about his conversion as a great exchange. He had spent his life his, his life doing all things that he thought would cause him personally earn righteousness and achieve salvation. Mm -hmm. When he met Christ, he came to understand that those things that he thought were great gain was actually lost, well, actually in a lost column. So he exchanged them for the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith in Christ. Minister, we have a lot to talk about. And so can you pick up with verse 5 and take us into the, uh, the, the, the reading of the scripture for tonight? I'd be happy to. Paul's testimony reinforces a point that he made in Philippians 3.3, 3, where he says that true believers glory in God and put no confidence in the flesh. Mm -hmm. He had come to understand that salvation is not obtained by human achievement, but it is rather divine accomplishment, the result of what God has done through Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3, 2, the apostle had condemned the teaching of the Judaizers who were legalistic Jewish converts in the, in the church at Philippi. He anticipates their response of arguing that the Gentile Philippian believers did not understand the rich spiritual heritage of Judaism. Mm. They could not say that about Paul, who demonstrated that his Jewish credentials were stronger than theirs. Reading from Galatians 1.14 says, I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. Pastor, I'd just like to make a point here where Paul talks about his traditions. Mm -hmm. And in this passage, Paul <coughs> said that he had lived much of his life motivated mm -hmm. by the traditions of his ancestors. Mm -hmm. And But when he met Christ and when God revealed Christ to him, Paul let go of those traditions and he held fast to the truth. And you know, so many times we have family traditions that right, we yeah. live by, mm -hmm. but you know what those family traditions must give way to truth, to God's word. And sometimes those family traditions don't 
always line up with scripture, but we have to choose truth over traditions. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Paul's words in the Galatian passage is one of the greatest statements of the doctrine of salvation in the scriptures. The apostle Paul makes the point that if salvation could have been achieved by man's works, he would have obtained it. He clearly states that man must seek the righteousness that comes from God based on faith. Amen, yes. Amen. So our foundational passage of scripture for this discussion is coming from Philippians 3, verses 4 through 11. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. It begins by saying, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, mm -hmm. if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Mm -hmm. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Amen. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Thank Pastor, you. Pastor, would you like to start our presentation? Yes, let's get to the presentation. And we want to start this presentation with, with, with this question. What does not produce righteousness? So we're going to look at verses 4 and 6, and I'm going to read. It states in verse 4, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. So let's look at this flesh that the scripture talks about. Because Paul begins by stating that he had surpassing credentials mm -hmm. to be self-righteous. He then proceeds to explain to the church why they did not cause him to achieve salvation. Mm. Now let's look at three, four things, four things, rituals, race, rank, and religion, which is outlined in verse five. Now, rituals. Since he was a Jew by birth, he followed the Jewish rituals from the beginning. Mm. Circumcision was a Jewish ceremony that initiated one into the covenant people and was considered the most essential rite in Judaism. However, it had no power, it had no power to make one righteous. Amen. Now, now, when we look at race, because Paul was by birth a member of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, he had inherited all of the blessings that came with being a part of God's covenant people. Mm -hmm. As a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he alone with other Jews thought that circumcision and their racial heritage brought them righteousness. This was not the case, not even from Abraham. Mm -hmm. Galatians 3, 6, and 7 reads, so also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
understand then that those who were those who have faith are children of Abraham. So let's look at this other part called the rank. The Israelite, the Israelite tribe of Benjamin was one of the most respected tribes in the, in the nation, of which we know King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, was a member of that part. Paul's family could trace their lineage back to Jacob's son, Benjamin which made them prominent in Israel, but this did not impress God. Amen. Now regarding the religion, calling himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, the apostle had been a member of a prominent Jewish sect, mm -hmm. the Pharisees. They were the most elite, mm -hmm. influential, and high, highly respected group in Israel. Yeah. He had strictly maintained his family and his nation's traditional religious heritage. He left his native city of Tarsus and went to Jerusalem to study under the famous rabbi Gamaliel. Mm -hmm. Acts 23, verse 6 says, says this, Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadduc Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. We also read in Acts 22, 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Sic Sicily, but, but brought up in this, in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Now, Minister, can you talk to us about this sincerity and strict observance? I would be happy to. As we continue looking at what does not produce righteousness, in verse 6 of our passage, Paul says, sincerity and strict observance will not produce righteousness. Now, Paul had a, a, a zeal for God that caused him to be very sincere in doing what he thought was right. The Jews considered Christianity as a dangerous religious sect that needed to be destroyed. Can mm -hmm. you imagine that? Mm -hmm. After the martyrdom of Stephen, a great persecution broke out in Jerusalem that caused the church to be scattered. Saul, who would soon become Paul, eagerly eagerly participated in, in that persecution. And he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. You know, it's one thing to have a passion and a sincerity about something, mm -hmm. but we have to check that sincerity to right, make sure right. that it's lining up again with God's word. And Paul had a, a great zeal and mm -hmm. thought he was doing the right mm -hmm. thing, thought he was doing a good thing. But again, we find that Paul was sincerely wrong in his acts of, 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 of persecuting the church. Yes. And in Acts 8, 1, we, it says, and Saul approved of their killing, killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in, Jer in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. In Acts 8, 3, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. In Acts 9, verses 1 and 2, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Pastor, the book of Acts, the early Christians were called the way. Right, They, yeah. they were uh, called the, who were the followers of the way. It wasn't necessarily at that point in time that they were called followers of Jesus, but mm. they were called followers of the way. Yeah. And regarding strict observance, as a strict observer of Jewish laws and traditions, mm -hmm. Paul was a model of correctness. He appeared to have it all. He had undergone the proper rituals, 
was a member of God's chosen people. He was a strict observer of Jewish law and was zealously persecuting the perceived evil of Christianity. But he came to understand that none of these things made him righteous in the eyes of God. Mm. You know what, Minister, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm keying in on this part that you read, model of correctness. Mm -hmm. This, to, to me, sounds like this is somebody who crosses all the T's, they dot all the I's, they are above scrutiny, can nobody find anything that they could hold against them. And they, this is the kind of person that will probably look their nose down on others. This is the person that will correct every little bitty thing about something that they said that was out of order. Okay, so when I see this model of correctness, that there was nothing about this person that we could find any any blame or any you know anything that was false about them. But you know, I think about as you were talking about a model of correctness. You know, sometimes people think they're outward actions may, whether it be uh, faithful in church, mm -hmm. they're faithfully giving, they're faithfully serving, and for them, that is a model of correctness. Mm -hmm. But does it line up with what God requires mm -hmm. as correctness or what God defines mm -hmm. as one who is a true follower of Christ? You know, we can have all of the outward expressions of being a believer right. and being a Christian, right. but if our heart it is, it's a heart affair that makes us true believers and make us true followers of Christ, not the outward actions necessarily. Of, of course, when we become a believer, there should be some actions that follow or mm -hmm. that show that we are sincere believers, but just doing the outward things does not necessarily make us true followers of Christ. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Minister. And we want to move on to what is obtained through Christ. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. It begins by, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I counted all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, my, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death <clears throat> excuse me in order that i may obtain attain the resurrection from the dead mm -hmm. and so what did he gain the apostle states that everything that he had thought was benefit to him mm -hmm. was gladly exchanged for the benefit of true righteousness mm -hmm. that he gained through Jesus Christ. Now, we want also want to look at this what's known as knowledge and righteousness. In regards to knowledge, Paul willingly abandoned his past religious achievements for what he termed the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, knowing Jesus Christ. Christ himself said that Knowing him was eternal life. Yeah. Knowing Christ means that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God has penetrated the darkness that previously ruled one's heart. Mm -hmm. It means also that one has received the revelation of the knowledge of salvation on a personal level. Mm -hmm. The apostle had come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and he realized that this was far more important than anything he had ever possessed. Mm -hmm. We want to look at John chapter 17 and look at the third verse, and it states, this is, the eternal, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Mm -hmm. 
Also in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it states, For God said, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so, in regards to righteousness, Paul, the Apostle Paul, came to understand that his righteousness, which is right standing with God, had not, become, had not come because of his strict observance of the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. It was rather the result of his placing faith in Christ and accepting the free gift, the free gift of God's righteousness by grace. Amen. Pastor, can I just also just, uh, just reiterate the fact that we can never do enough righteous acts to earn salvation mm -hmm. or to be declared righteous in the eyes of God. Yes. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, uh, around verses 4 through 6, he says, our greatest acts of righteousness are like filthy rags before yes, God. Yes, yes. And as we think about filthy rags, as we really know what, what the prophet <laughs> Isaiah is talking about when he addresses those filthy rags. Yeah. And to know that filthy rags are only good for what burning or being thrown into mm -hmm. the fire. And so when we think that we can do enough righteous acts or to measure up to God's standard, mm -hmm. he said that our very best acts of righteousness are as filthy rags before God. And so I think uh, last week in our uh, Bible study, Teacher Yvonne said, how, many, how, how much righteousness is enough? Yeah. We could never yeah. do enough uh, righteous acts to, to be declared righteous before mm -hmm. God. So we could not earn that free gift of salvation as God has given to us. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, minister. That is so good. Moving on. He gladly exchanged the burden of the legalistic self-righteousness for the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ Jesus. At, at, at the point of salvation, the sinner has their sins imputed to Christ and the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. You know, this is so key. And, and I really want uh, the people out there to really get this. At, and I'm going to read it again. At the point of salvation, the sinner has their sins imputed to Christ and the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. This is the heart of the gospel message. Amen, Pastor. And Amen. again, can I just <laughs> interject yes, yes, the, go ahead. the fact that another great exchange, that, that word imputed, we don't hear too often, but mm -hmm. this again is the great exchange that takes place in the life of the believer. When you accept Christ as your Lord yes. and as your Savior, Christ takes our sins and in exchange, he give us his righteousness. Yes, yes. And there again, we cannot do anything to earn the righteousness, but it is an exchange that takes place at the moment, at the second that a person invites Jesus wow. Christ into wow, their heart, into their life. And, yeah. and, you know, that great exchange takes place. And, you know, as I think about that, it just brings a, a upwelling of joy in my heart and mm -hmm. just tears to my eyes to think about the fact that Jesus would mm -hmm. take on my sins, mm -hmm. but in exchange give me his righteousness. Yes, man. That's, Amen. That's something. Thank you. Thank you, minister. That is so mm -hmm. good. That is so rich. Romans 1, 17 states this, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, mm -hmm. as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that's you and me and all of us out here listening yes. so that in him we might become the righteousness of god mm -hmm. minister can you talk about this power and fellowship amen again as we continue to look at what we gain through christ according to verse 10 in our passage we gain power and fellowship regarding power the initial saving knowledge that the Apostle Paul experienced motivated him to a lifelong pursuit 
of a deeper knowledge of Christ. Mm. He had come to understand that there was no power in the law mm -hmm. and that there was no power in the flesh. <laughs> to over, no power in the flesh to overcome sin. The mm -hmm. law only brought the knowledge of sin and the flesh was forever prone to sinfulness. Mm -hmm. In Romans 3.20, in New Living Translation, Paul says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Mm. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Wow. And in Romans 8, 3, he says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Hmm. Further stated in Romans 7, 18, Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. And, you know, I also think about a, a passage of scripture that Paul talks about, you know, mm -hmm. the very things that he wanted to do were the things that he ended up not doing. Mm -hmm. And the things that he did not want to do were the very things that he ended up doing. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, Paul, like all believers, was given the Holy Spirit with the same spiritual power that raised <coughs> Jesus from the dead. Mm -hmm. He understood that this was the power that saved him and had given him the ability to live a sanctified life, to live a holy life, to live a life that is set apart unto Christ as he defeated temptations and trials. And the same Holy Spirit that is at work, that was at work in the life of Paul, is at work in me and you as believers. Now, we cannot live this Christian life that God is calling us to live independent of mm -hmm. the help of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. who the scripture declares as our helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. Uh, he's a, the paraclete, the one who walks along beside us, right. helping us daily in our walk and in our relationship and in our fellowship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Having exchanged his weakness for the resurrection power of Christ, he wanted to experience it to the fullest. He is not referring to the ultimate resurrection of all believers, which will certainly happen, but to the personal power to overcome and to rise above whatever he would encounter in life. Mm -hmm. Pastor, would you like to take up? You know, you know I, but I want to, I want to want minister to comment on something that you uh, said back up in, in section eight. Mm -hmm. You said, the, Paul, like all believers, was given the Holy Spirit with the same spiritual power yes. that raised Jesus from the dead. Imagine that. Yes. Imagine that. When we accepted Christ, at the moment that we accept Christ, we got that same power mm -hmm. that raised Jesus from the dead. That's a hallelujah shouting to, 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 exactly. to know that wretched man like me who was a sinner who knew who had nothing good in him but Christ saw me died for me then gave me that the moment that I accepted him the same power that raised him from the dead and you know pastor is so unfortunate we have mm. such power living in us and at work in us but sometimes we live like we have no power. That's we live right. powerless. And, and, and to think that the resurrection power is at work in us, that supernatural power, yes, that yes. dunamis power that is at work in the life of every believer, yes. whether you feel like it or not. You know, the Holy Spirit is, our having and possessing the Holy Spirit is not based upon feelings, but it is based on the fact of scripture. This is what God said. And so we accept it because God said it, not because we feel like it or because we don't see the manifestation, but it is a fact that we as believers mm -hmm. have the Holy Spirit, that resurrection power living in us. Yes, we do. Hey, you know, I, I want to say to those out there that you have the power within you. Don't let the devil trick you. Right. 
and he's tricking and fooling people every day. Every day. And, and it's not the ones that, who don't know Christ that he's fooling. He's also tricking the ones that say they know Christ mm -hmm. too as well, mm -hmm. making them think that they are powerless, that they cannot overcome different obstacles and different things right. in their life. We, the, we, just, we just read it right here, okay, that we have been given the same power, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Man, that's something, okay. In regarding fellowship, the apostle expressed his desire for a deep partnership and communion with Christ. He had to come to the understanding that Christ experienced more intense persecution mm -hmm. and suffering than anyone in history. Wow. As a result, he is the believer's understanding and merciful high priest who relates to their pain. He is uniquely, uniquely qualified to help us in our weaknesses and our infirmities. Yeah. The deepest moment of fellowship with Christ comes during times of intense suffering, which drives us closer to him. I, I, I need to stop. I need to stop. <laughs> I need to stop. This, I, I, did you just hear what I just read? Can you read it again? Did you read <laughs> It says, and, and, and please bear with us, bear with us, because I need for those of you out there to really understand this. The deepest moment of fellowship with Christ comes during times of not just suffering, but intense suffering, which drives us closer to him. Mm. But this is, the, but this is, this is the, the, the nugget right here. God granted Paul this fellowship. Close fellowship. This close fellowship. It wasn't just a fellowship. It was a close fellowship that God granted Paul and it sustained him throughout his ministry. And you know, Pastor, as you talk about that intense suffering, and so often we want to avoid suffering. Yes, you know, we want yes, to live yes, comfortable yes, lives yes. free of any type of uh, discomfort or any type of suffering. But suffering is one of the tools that God uses for us to have that intimate relationship with him. And, and you think about when we want to avoid those times of suffering, those times of, of trials, we are running away from building that intimacy mm -hmm. that God mm -hmm. wants us to establish, having that fellowship with him. And that is how we get to know God. And that was one of the things Paul said. He said, I want to know him in the fullness, mm -hmm. even of his suffering and of that resurrection power. And so you, you have to ask yourself, how much do I really want to know Christ? <laughs> yeah. How much do I yeah. really want to know yeah. him? You know, Paul on the Damascus road, it was told that Jesus said that Paul had, will, will know and find out, I'm just kind of paraphrasing, and know and find out how much that he is going to suffer for me, mm -hmm. okay? And indeed, he has suffered. He has suffered second only to Christ more than any of the disciples or any character of the New Testament. He has really suffered a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, it, I, was, I was minded of a statement that I used to hear a pastor say, and that is, uh, in order for Christ to use you mightily, he may have to break you. I said, break, break me, okay? And that's, that's when you can be used when you've been broken. Yes. When you've been because now you are helpless, which means that now you have to put full dependency on him. Amen. You can't come with all your education, you can't come with all your knowledge, you can't come with all the worldly acumens that, that you may have achieved because that won't help you. You gotta come broken. Wow. You know, you have to come broken before him when he now can use you mightily. Amen. Wow. wow, amen. Ah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. <clears throat> the resurrection to eternal life, in verse 11. 
when Paul exchanged his legalistic self-righteousness for the righteousness that came through faith in Jesus Christ, he obtained resurrection from the dead and eternal life. Mm. This will occur at the rapture when all believers will be raised to meet Christ in the air. Mm. This is the promise of scripture and the great hope of the believer. Mm -hmm. Everything we encounter and endure in this life will be worth it all when we see Jesus face to face. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through verse 53, a passage of scripture that is mainly recited often. at, uh, often read, that's yeah. often recited at, uh, at funerals, okay? It says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will raise imperishable and we will be changed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. For this perishable must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians, which is another passage that's, that's normally quoted, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to, 4, 16 to 18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. 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 You know what? This has been, this has really been rich. This has really been good. And it, but it brings us uh, to our summation. Getting to know Jesus Christ through salvation is the most important thing that anyone can do. Mm -hmm. It brings peace with God the blessings of being in the family of God and gives the guarantee of eternal life. Mm -hmm. All believers, all believers have received this incredible gift from God and should share the good news of Christ with everyone they can and should endeavor to live a life that will be a light to, <clears throat> to draw unbelievers to God. God. Minister, do you have any closing remarks? Well, just to reiterate the fact that we can never do enough works to gain or to earn salvation or to be declared righteous yes. by God because, again, the, the trick of the enemy, you know, the free gift of salvation for some people is it's hard for them to accept, you mm -hmm. know, the free gift that comes from God that I must do something in order to earn salvation, but there's not enough works that we can do to earn salvation. But salvation is a free gift, a free grace gift that God has given to those who receive his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, and all I have to just say is ditto. It's free, it's free, it's free. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope that you have been blessed by the lesson and the messages tonight. Uh, until next time, stay safe and stay with God. Emmanuel Community Church is located at 12607 Crenshaw Boulevard in the city of Hawthorne, California. You can find all of our messages on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click subscribe and thanks for watching. Be blessed for God is with us.